Uncle Gerald and Witchcraft. Welcome. I remember, it would have been somewhere around 64, maybe 1965. Do you know, it could even have been 66. I mean, I was only a child, a young child at the time. Uh, but I was absolutely delighted when I found that my Uncle Gerald had left me some shares in his will. Now, I should add that I never met Uncle Gerald. He was from my dad's side of the family, so originated in Liverpool. Uh, but I don't think he'd spent much of his life in Liverpool. No, he'd worked overseas for most of his life. Now, the shares were in the Koala Lumper Rubber Company. So, presumably, Uncle Gerald had worked in the rubber trade in Malaysia. Certainly as a child I remember many things from Malaysia. Sago pudding, turtle soup, koya mats, rattan furniture. But maybe everybody of my age from the UK does. Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner's fam came from a wealthy family. They ran the family firm Joseph Gardner and Sons the oldest private timber trade company within the British Empire, which specialised in the import of hardwoods. Uh, Joseph was apparently known to strip naked during rainstorms and wander around in the, in the nude. Um, the family was said to have descended from Scottish, Scottish woman Grisel Gardner, who was burned at the stake as a witch in Newburgh in 1610, uh, but both of these come from Gardner himself, who is not a particularly good, uh, particularly reliable account. Uh, Gardner's father, William Robert Gardner, 1844 to 1935, had been the youngest son of Joseph Gardner, who was, Joseph Gardner was born in 1791. In 19, sorry, 1867, William was sent out to New York, uh, in order to further the interests of the family firm. And it was here that he met uh, Louise uh, Bergelow Ennis, whom he married on the 25th of November, 1868. Uh, they moved back to England, and certainly by 1873, they settled in the Glen, a large Victorian house in Blundellsands, Liverpool, in 1876, the family moved into one of the neighbouring houses, Ingle Lodge, and it was here that their third son, Gerald Brousseau Gardner, was born on February the 13th, on Friday the 13th of June, 1884. A gardener suffered from chronic asthma from a young age, having particular difficulty in the cold winters on the Atlantic coast there. The gardeners employed an Irish nursemaid named Josephine Com McCombie, who looked after the young Gerald, spending far more time with him than, than his parents did. His nursemaid offered to take him to warmer climes at his father's expense in the hope that this condition, that his condition would not be so badly affected. So in the summer 1888, Gerald and Con travelled via London to Nice in the south of France. Then in 1891 they went to the Canary Islands. From there they went to Accra in Ghana and then to Funchal on the Portuguese colony of Madeira. Indeed they'd spend most of the next nine years on that island, only returning to England for three or four months in the summer. Con saw these trips as opportunities to look for a husband, seeing Gardner as something of a nuisance. As a result, he was largely left to his own devices, which he spent going out, meeting new people and learning about foreign cultures. As a result of his illness and the foreign trips, Gardner ultimately never attended school or gained any formal education. He taught himself to read by looking at copies of the Strand magazine, uh, but his writing shows his poor education with highly eccentric spelling and grammar. It like mine. In 1900, Con married David Elkington, who owned a tree plantation in the then British colony, uh, British colony that's now called Sri Lanka. It was agreed that the, with the gardeners that Gerald would live with her on the tree plantation. 
at his father's expense, Gardner trained as a tra trainee plantera. Uh, although he disliked the dreary endlessness of the work, he enjoyed being outdoors and near the forests. He spent much of his spare time hunting deer, trekking through the local forests, becoming an, uh, acquainted with the Sinhalese natives and taking a great interest in their Buddhist beliefs. In December 1904, his parents and a younger brother visited him. With his father to, uh, asking, uh, he, with he, he asking his father to invest in a pioneering rubber plantation which Gardner was going to manage. It was known as the Atlanta Estate, but allowed him a great deal of leisure time. However, the experiment with rubber growing proved relatively unsuccessful, and Gardner's father decided to sell the property in 1911. That year, Gardner moved to North Brit uh, British North Bonio gaining employment as a rubber planter. Gardner became friendly with many of the locals, including the Dyak and Dusan people. He was intrigued by the tattoos of the Dyaks, and pictures of him in later life show a large snake, or it could be a dragon tattoo, on his forearms, presumably obtained at the time. Uh, taking great interest in indigenous religious beliefs, he attended Dusan healing rituals. He was unhappy about the working conditions and racist attitudes of his colleagues and left Borneo. He was offered a job working as assistant on a rubber plantation in Parak, Parak in northern Malaysia by the Borneo company. Arriving in the area, he decided to supplement his income by purchasing his own estate on which he, he could grow his own rubber. Here Gardner made friends with an American called Cornwall who converted to Islam and married a local Malay woman. Through Cornwall, Gardner was introduced to many locals, whom he soon befriended, including members of the Senoi and the Malay peoples. Cornwall invited Gardner to, to take the Shadada, uh, which is the Muslim con confession of faith, which once you've said it, you be or said it meaning it, you become a Muslim. And he did so. It allowed him to gain the trust of the locals, although there's no real evidence that he became a back practicing Muslim. Cornwall was interested in local peoples, including their magical and spiritual beliefs, to which he also introduced Gardner, who took a particular interest in the Chris, the ritual knife with magical uses. Indeed, he's the author of Chris and many other and, and other sorry and other Malay weapons. And as you all know, I too am very interested in Chris. I mean, they originate in Java and I've got my own little collection. And yes, I do use them in a ritual sense, certainly clean them in a ritual sense. He continued to manage a rubber plantation, but at the end of the war, commodity prices dropped. And by 1924, one, it was difficult to make a profit. In September 1923, he successfully applied to the Office of Customs to become a government inspector of government of rubber plantations, a job that involved a great amount of travelling around the country, something which he loved. In 1926, he was placed in charge of monitoring the shops selling opium, noting regular irregularities and a thriving illegal control, uh, trade in a controlled substance. Believing opium to be essentially harmless, there's evidence that um, Gardner took on many bribes in this position, earning himself a small fortune. Witchcraft. Uh, Gerald Manny Donner, and eventually they returned to England, to Highcliffe near Bournemouth. Here they purchased a house built in 1923 named Southridge. In Highcliffe, Gardner came across a building describing itself as the first Rosicrucian theatre in England. And although sceptical of the Rosicrucian order, Gardner got on well with the group of individuals uh, who, who ran it. According to Gardner, who, like Alistair Crowley, you have to take much with a pinch of salt. One night in September 1939, he was taken to a large house owned by old Dorothy Cluck Clutterbuck, a wealthy woman where he was made to strip naked and was taken through an initiation ceremony. 
Uh, but we do have to point out that Gardner himself was a keen naturalist. Halfway through the ceremony, he claims that he heard the wicker uh, for male and wicke for female. And he recognised as the Old English for witch. Uh, this group he claimed were the New Forest Coven. And he believed them to be one of the few surviving covens of the ancient pre-Christian witch cult religion. Although in reality, if it indeed existed and wasn't invented by Gerald, it was founded, maybe by Gerald, but certainly it was founded in the 1930s. A gardener's friend, Arnold Crowley, introduced him to Alistair, uh, Arnold Crowther, sorry, introduced him to mm. Alistair Crow mm. Crowley, the ceremonial magician who'd founded the religion of Thelema in 1904. Shortly after, after Crowley's death, uh, before his death, Crowley elevated Gardner to the fourth degree of the Ordo Templi Orentis OTO and, issued, and supposedly issued a charter decreeing that Gardner could admit many people into the medieval degree. Although as this was in Gardner's handwriting, and it was only actually signed by Crowley himself. Uh, from November 1947 to March 1948, Gardner and his wife toured the United States, visiting relatives in Memphis, but also visiting New Orleans, where Gardner hoped he'd learn about voodoo. <coughs> During his voyage, Crowley had died, and as a result, cons Gardner considered himself the head of the OTO in Europe, a position a position accepted by Lady Frieda Harris. But Gardner soon lost interest in leading the OTO, and in 1951 he was replaced by Frederick Mellinger as the OTO's European representative. A wicker. Intent on perpetuating witchcraft, Gardner found the Brickett Wood Coven with his wife Donna in the 1940s. After buying the Naturalists, Naturalist Five Acres Country Club in Hertfordshire, much of the coven's early members were drawn, much of the coven's early membership was drawn from the club's members and its meetings were held in the club's ground. And many notable figures of early Wiccan were direct initiates of this coven including Daffo, whom he had a long-term rela um, relationship with, Doreen Valiente, Jack Bracelin, Frederick Lamond, uh, Dayon Onis, Eleanor Bone, and Lois Bourne. Uh, there is no evidence that he ever called it Wicca, although he did refer to the collective community of pagan witches of Wicca, which means the one. Uh, the name for the religion Wicca developed in Britain during the 1960s. Its traditional core beliefs and practices were outlined in the 40s and 50s by Gardner and his early high priestess Doreen Valiente. The early practices were disseminated through books and in secret, secret written and oral traditions passed along these initiates. Indeed, these early initiates went on to spread uh, Wicca and, and, to a certain degree, variants of Wicca, uh, certainly around England, but later around the world. Gardner is known as the father of modern witchcraft and the author of the Wiccan Bible, the Book of Shadows. Uh, there are many variations of the core structure because, as I say, it's, it doesn't have a sort of formal leadership structure. And the religion grows and evolves over time. It's divided into a number of diverse lineages, sects and denominations, referred to as traditions, each with its own organisational structure and level of centralisation. Uh, the religion accompanies theists, atheists, I should say duotheists, because of uh, the core of the religion is really duotheists and agnostic with some viewing the religious deities as, as entities with a, literal, with a literal existence 
and are others viewing them as Jungian archetypes or symbols. Even amongst theistic Wiccans, there are divergent beliefs, and Wicca includes pantheists, monotheists, duotheists, and polytheists. Common to these divergent perspectives, however, is that Wiccan deities are viewed as forms of ancient, pre-Christian divinities by its practitioners. And many Wiccans believe in magic. They see it as a manipulative force exercised through the practice of witchcraft or sorcery. Many agri Wiccans agree with the definition of magic offered by ceremonial magicians, that magic is the science and control of the secret forces of nature. And many Wiccans believe magic to be the law of nature, as yet misunderstood or disregarded by contemporary science. And as such, they do not view it as being supernatural. Some Wiccans believe that magic is simply making use of the five senses to achieve surprising results, while other Wiccans do not claim to not know while other Wiccans claim to not know how magic works, merely believing that it does because they've observed it to do so. Uh, during ritual practices which are often staged in the sacred circles, Wiccans cast spells or workings intended to bring about real changes in the physical world. Common Wiccan spells include those for healing, for protection, fertility, or to banish negative influences. Uh, the classic ritual scheme in British traditional Wicca is purification of the sacred space and the participants, casting the circle, calling the elemental quarters, Cone of Power, Drawing Down the Gods, Spell Casting, Great White Rite, Wine Cakes Chanting Dancing Games, Farewell to the Quarters and Participants. Many early re re uh, uh, Wiccans referred to their own magic as White Magic, which contrasted with the Black Magic which they associated with evil and sat Satanism. Now, I was going to say Mancunian Alexanders, but in fact, I find he's from Birkenhead, which most people would consider Liverpool. So I know they're Liverpudlian. Liverpudlians don't consider it Liverpool. They call them woollybacks and say it's across the water because it's across the River Mersey. But anyway, Alexanders used a similar terminology of left-hand path to describe malevolent magic, and right-hand path to describe magic performed with good intentions. Now, of course, this originates in Tantra beliefs, uh, but I think he probably simply borrowed it from theosophy. Uh, these rites often include special magical tools. These include a knife called a athema, a wand, a pentacle, a chalice, but other tools including a broomstick known as a besom, a cauldron, candles, incense and a curved blade known as a bowling. An altar is usually present in the circle on which ritual tools are placed and representations of the god and goddess might be displayed. Uh, before entering the circle, some traditions, some traditions fast for the day and so they often ritually bathe. After the ritual is finished, the god, the goddess and the guardians are thanked and the directions are dismissed and the circle is closed. And the magic of the cunning folk tended to be date about day-to-day -day events in the lives of the common people. Uh, but Gerald and Doreen Valiente used magic in an attempt to defeat the Germans in World War II, or at least to prevent the invasion of Britain. So Wicca does, and, and still does, have much more ambitious aims than those of the cunning folk. Legacy. Gerald died in 1964 aboard his ship en route, en route to the Lebanon and is buried in Tunis. So was Gerald really my uncle? Well, I can't really find much evidence that he was. But it's an interesting thought. However, there's every bit as much substance to the idea that Gerald was my uncle 
as those who claim that Dick Wicker is directly linked to the traditions of the cunning folk. And whatever, the world needs more mavericks like Gerald, and he certainly was a maverick. Uh, like Crowley, you cannot, cl- cannot believe a lot of what he said or wrote. For example, he claimed to have two PhDs on British television when he was uneducated. And in my experience, this is a sure fire indication of narcissism. Uh, but unlike Crowley, who, who I keep saying I must do a vlog on, but I find it so difficult because people hold such strong views about him. And I have to say, I, I, if there is a line, then I see Gerald as the right side of the line and Alistair Crowley the wrong. In this, this TV appearance, it was actually Panorama, the most popular TV show at the time in England. And that, more than anything, was responsible for the initial spread of Wicker in Britain. Although, of course, now Wicker has spread around the world and is said to be one of the fastest growing religions. I get the impression, however, that many Wiccans try to distance themselves from this lovable rogue. In part, I think it's because they wish to claim that Wicker is a tradition, is based on traditional beliefs of the cunning folk rather than a merger of Malay, Dayak, Freemasonry, OTO and Rosicrucian traditions. Of course, there are <coughs> some traditional coming folk traditions in it. And of course, Malay magic is, is really comes from Javanese magic. So no wonder I find so many similarities between modern Western traditions and the magic I witness in Java. But I think we're hitting on the problem I have with Wicker, more so than Gerald, who I just see as a lovable rogue. Uh, Because to me, religion and magic are inextricably linked. Of course, in the 1950s, England, there was a legal reason to wish to be seen as religion and commercial reasons, especially in the US, to be registered in as a religion. Uh, But I believe it does it great harm. Uh, whilst the left hand tradition in Tantra is a very important concept, I find the focus on black and white magic somewhat illusory. Any attempt to intervene in nature and God's will needs to be treated very seriously. As I, I, as I outline in the vlog, is magic permissible? So every participant really needs to consider every action personally not just follow what the coven is doing and supporting. Uh, But I also need to consider that if Wicker really was a product of Gerald's magical experience, can we truly claim all these to be white magic? And knowing what I do of some of them, I would say definitely not. Uh, But in the main, I see Wicker as genuine people. Genuine people trying to create a better world by taking their clothes off. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog. And that, yeah, not only got something out of it, but provoked thoughts. I'm not here to push my beliefs, my thoughts on you. Only to open up your own thinking. Get you thinking about the world and life. When I started The Real Magic of Java, I believed that I'd only release them every month or or maybe every two months. Uh, But now I find myself adding to this, this subsection. Once or twice a week. Uh, But please subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications for when I add new parts to this subsection. In part, the reason why I'm doing it more often is that the concept has moved from filming rituals and events that took place in Java to me also describing my beliefs and philosophy. And and that does come in response to people expressing an interest in it. But of course, you know, 
me actually seeing rituals and events uh, really doesn't happen so often. What I would say to you is that there's no attempt at subterfuge on my behalf. And when I do experience rituals, I will include them for you to see. And as I say, there's, there's no way I'm trying to mislead you. And if, if I believe there is subterfuge, uh, if I uncover it, I will point it out to you. I'm trying to be as honest as I can be. Now, please make comments. Please ask questions. And I'll try to be as, as honest and open with you as I can be. Of course, there will be some of you who disagree with me, particularly when I talk in terms, to, terms of my own beliefs, my own feelings. And, you know, you're welcome to alternative feelings and we can agree to disagree. Um, sometimes I find that people on YouTube can be unnecessarily attacking and aggressive and at times I don't restrain myself enough and I apologise, but it's not my intention to put anybody down, you know. I, I know what I talk about can be emotive um, and it, it can be challenging challenging to your beliefs um, but you know I'd, I'd love to enter an open discussion a heartfelt discussion but unfortunately I, I often come across things that are oh especially when people quote the scriptures to me I, I, I've just no idea where it takes us you know because I'm speaking from the heart you know, I mean, you know, sorry, sorry. If you want to quote the scriptures, I mean, do so. But it doesn't have much impact on me, you know. I personally have no desire to impose my feelings on you. And I suppose when people try to do it to me, I, you know, it, it, well, it washes off, you know. All I'm trying to do is I, 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 I'm trying to share my feelings with you. And I, I'd love, I'd love an open discussion on feelings. I really would. I really would love it, you know, and, and sorry, sorry if I don't always react as, as best I should. I, I try and cure this in myself, but I think this is part of the sort of narcissism of social media that I talk about so much in this subsection. So look, if you've enjoyed it, I really urge you to listen to other sections on this channel, particularly the four audio books that I've uploaded onto this channel. Yes, they are in a novel format. They are novels. But they go into much greater depth than my thoughts and feelings. Now, what I would say to you is these are sequential. So my thoughts and feelings develop as we go through each chapter and each book. So it does begin with 1.1, the Chinese cemetery. But, you know, hey, it's up to you. Feel free to dip in as, as you wish, as you want. And, you know, really heartfelt thanks for listening to this. And I really want to say a great big thank you and God bless you.